So without the word further ado, I would like to introduce Julian Forgot. Kiitos. Good evening. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about a um, couple of stories of life and uh, um, pretty much all of them kind of around the leap of faith. Um, yes, having big ideas is, is a great thing and it's an important thing and we'll get to that. Um, but how do you get to making the jump to make this big idea happen? Um, so a couple of words about myself. That's my name. Uh, it's a bit hard to pronounce in Finnish. Uh, Forgeaud is probably the way to say it. Um, in French, um, we say Fourjo. So that would probably be written F U R J O or G J, yeah, J O in Finnish. Fourjo. Um, you can reach me there. Um, so I'm a so called catalyst. Um, I accelerate things, I speed things up, I make things happen faster. And, um, and my job is to make things happen, no matter if it's in a company or if it's my own company or I'm trying to do the same in my own life um, every day. Um, on Facebook, on Twitter, feel free to ask me questions, feel free to connect, um, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer. There might be a bit of, of delay of ping on my answers if I'm traveling, but happy to do so still. So, a quick definition. A leap of faith in its most commonly used meaning is the fact of believing in or accepting something intangible or unprovable or without empirical evidence. We'll get back to that. But basically, it is jumping, not being sure of what's going to happen. Right? It's giving it a shot, not knowing for sure that things are going to go as according to plan. So who here is, is part of a startup? Who is a student still? Well, there are some people that are both a student and part of a startup, and that's great. Uh, who is a, a professional in a company, in a regular company? So we still have some of those left. <laughs> Hopefully you're not working for Nokia. Um, I used to work for Nokia, so I, I can make the joke. Um, so. Let's, let's start with, uh, with a story, and it's, um, it's a story of a little boy that, that comes from a really, really, really small place in the Alps. And uh, he, um, he's the first of the family. He uh, spends a lot of time, of course, with his parents, um, but he also spends a lot of time with, uh, with his grandparents, um, who are entrepreneurs, who have set up a company um, in the industry, um, manufacturing industry, in the valley where, where he's from, which is the... Uh, the former Clockwork Valley um, in France, which supplies parts for Switzerland for the watches. Um, so he, he spends a lot of time with them and, and he gets the chance to travel with them and, and they open his eyes on, on the world. Not just on, on the small valley where he's from, but, but on places like Paris. The first trip that he does there with his parents, he's on one of these boats, he's really small and he, you know, lays on the last rows of all the chairs. And what happens is that the last row falls, and the one before falls, and the one before falls. And it just goes a train wreck of chairs falling at the back of that boat. Um, so kind of traveling and, and experiencing things, thanks to his grandparents. Um, that's the factory in which he grows up. Um, he spends first his, his young age in a, in a small of park or whatever it's called, um, with uh, one of the uh, anecdotes of, of picking up the phone when the phone rings and answering in Italian, pronto, because the uh, company dealt at that time with a lot of Italian companies and, and the secretary was always answering in Italian. Um, he spends time wiping the floor, he spends time learning the basics of, of manufacturing, learning the basics of, of a family company or a family business with 40, 50 people. Um, and, and all of this kind of has a, a bit of an impact on, on his life, because he's the first one. He doesn't have that many kids around him. Um, it's, it's the only kids that he interacts with are the kids at school, which sometimes don't really understand him. When, when they spend the afternoon and, and the week, uh, holidays and so on, playing with their friends, playing football or cycling, he spends time at the factory learning how to sort parts, 
helping them with their computer system, even writing the, like uh, safety and security documents and all that kind of stuff, because he wants to learn, because he wants to, you know, to use that playground. And, and that's where he learns life, when others' kids learn life on the real playground, bouncing around and, and throwing marbles and so on. So that's when it gets a bit challenging for him to, to connect with his peers. And, and he ends up in high school in situations where he gets into fights, where he ends up at the hospital, he ends up at the police station on a Sunday morning, um, and, and these kind of things. So kind of challenges. But one morning, he's at, um, he's at school um, in his engineering class. So in high school, um, he has the chance to take engineering class, which is learning about mechanics, learning about electronics, learning about computer sciences, um, eight hours a week, um, and doing a specific degree in, in a kind of baccalaureate degree. And, uh, and that morning, the, uh, uh, the electronics teacher, Mr. Roux, um, stands in front of the class and says, you know what, guys and girls, girl, yeah, there was only one in the class. Um, we, you know, we, I've been thinking about it, and, and I've made a list of people that I believe would succeed at university. And I'm not talking about just normal university. I'm talking engineering school. So in France, there is this university level, which is public university and, and is not as good as the Finnish one. And then you have the engineering class, where you get after two years of preparatory class, where you do math and physics really intensive. Um, we call these people the moles, because they never see the sun. Um, and, and after that, get into engineering classes where you really, really develop yourself. So he, he's doing, you know, he's saying that, that he has that list. And, and, and of course, our, our teenager, 16, 17, 17 years old, is sitting at the back of the class and laughing his ass off. Like, yeah, well, this guy, this guy, they're probably on that list. And then the you know, the teacher goes on, one name after the other, and, and of course, the teenager in the back is like, yeah, yeah, I kind of knew that, until the teacher pronounces his name. At first, the teenager's like, what? In Finnish, he would be like, oh, I even got censored on that one. <laughs> Amazing. So he, he was like, yeah, right, thanks for the joke. And, and the teacher's like, no, no, I really think that you, know, you, you can make that happen, and you can get there. It's a really small village. I mean, he, he's been training for downhill ski racing. He's been thinking of doing his, his uh, ski instructor so that in the winter he's a ski instructor. In the summer he can do something else. Maybe doing something at a small place and, and learning a bit of, of electronics at the, at the really small university next door. But, you know, never getting out of the valley and never getting out of the mountains. So he gets back home that evening and he's like, Mom, you know what? I've heard a really good joke today. My teacher said that I could become an engineer. <laughs> and that's when he's always like, well, if he says so, then I believe that you can make that happen. What? Yeah, I'll pay for the exam, I'll pay for the trip to go to the exam, and you'll give it a shot. And that evening, I guess, was probably one of the key evenings of, of that teenager. Because he realized that not only, you know, a teacher could say something, but his mom and his parents believed in him and believed that he could do something that he had never thought of. Of course, it was scary. It's like, come on, there's going to be tons of other kids that have you know, really studied at school. <laughs> I've just been going by and I've, I've, yeah, okay, I've had fun and all that kind of stuff. But I, you know, the teenager is like, I've, I've never been in the top of the class. I'm never going to be able to do that. Time goes by and, and the exam comes. And the teenager goes to the exam. It's a three hours drive from the place he is from. Um, his dad gives him a ride because he has to visit a, um, a company nearby. He spends the day there, and he's there with another friend from the same class. And they get out of the exams, and they look at each other, and they're like, was it so simple? Was it so stupid? No, we must have gotten it wrong. It's not possible. It's never going to work. Well, two months later, the results come in. They both are accepted to the next session to go and do the oral exam, which is this time 500 kilometers away from where he lives, which is a huge trip for him because he's never done that on his own. Well, he still ends up going there. He passes the exam. He decides not to go to this school because he's taken in another engineering school in Paris. Well, from there on, that teenager has, has moved a lot. He's been doing a lot of great things, 
And he's been going to places that he never thought he would go to just by the small steps of believing in himself and giving it a shot. And this person is standing right now in front of you. So I've had these experiences. I've gone through that in my life, and it hasn't been pretty. But as soon as I got to university, something happened. You know, the bullying was finished. It was over. It was behind. Why? Because I was hanging out with engineers, or future engineers. People that understood what I meant when I spoke about binary. People that understood what Star Wars was. People that understood what an MP3 was. People that understood what you could do with technology and, and that wanted to help you with it. And, well, it was, you know, the, the field was just leveled. We all wanted to be there for the same reason. We wanted to make things happen. Of course, you had the ones that were put there because their parents thought that computer sciences was the future. But they didn't really care much. They were like, well, yeah, I'll just do the classes and figure something out. And then they ended up being commercial, you know, moving on to... Uh, another university afterwards or doing something else. But, but ultimately, by going to a university where I, I could spend time with people that had the same kind of attitude as me, I felt home and I had fun. So the whole time around that was a time of experimentation. You know, you're at university, it's fun. There's, there's, what is the risk? Especially in Finland. So I came to Finland to finish my master's degree. And I was amazed. You can take the exams three times. Like, what? what? You know, in, in France, you just, you just have one shot. And if you fail that exam, you might have a second one two or three months later, but if you fail that one, you've got to go back for another year. And you lose a year of your studies. Here, well, I've learned the system. I was going to class. I was listening. I was learning as much as possible in class. Not much at home. And then I would go to the exam. Let's see what I know. Then if I would pass with a two, is that good enough? Well, maybe for that course. If not, well, now I know what I know, and I know what I don't know. So let's go back to the books, or let's go to the books. <laughs> right? So, and then if it's not enough, and I really, really, really wanted to get a higher grade, then I would just go to you know, the third exam. But ultimately, university was a sandbox, and this is what it is. I mean, who is part of a, of a club or association here? Who is at, like, uh, in these people, at a higher responsibility level in these organizations? Uh -huh. Raise your hands higher. Yeah. yeah. So basically, this is your opportunity to learn about leadership, to learn about making things happen with zero budget, to learn about motivating people, to learn about focusing on what's essential. Doesn't that ring a bell? Isn't that what startups are supposed to be doing? Limited resources, let it be money or time or people. Really, a lot of passion that you really need to get through all these things and making things happen. So that, that's for the university, and that was a lot of fun. But you know, I also had a, a personal life, and, and I've done a lot of stuff outside of school and sports, essentially. Um, so I used to be uh, doing a lot of downhill ski racing uh, when I was a kid, and that's, that's pretty much what gave me these nice thighs. Uh, whoops, did I just jump through a lot of things? We'll get back to that. Um, but, but when I moved to Paris, um, I, I had to give up skiing. Because the only place you could ski in Paris is the Trocadero once a year. And that's, that's the stairs that go towards the Eiffel Tower. They put snow, they bring snow by trucks which is not really sustainable and, and ecological friendly, but still. And, um, and you can ski there once a year. So that was not really what I was looking forward to. So I would go back home and, and I would ski twice, three times a year at home. But ultimately, I, I was missing something. I was missing the, uh, you know, the adrenaline. I was missing the rush. I was missing pushing myself. So um, I got into skydiving, which is fun. Now, what they say is that... Uh, if you skydive once, you don't look at the sky the same way anymore. And is there any skydivers here or anybody that has made one jump before? Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. It's just, it's just freedom, right? You can compare that eventually to diving, normal diving, but it's, it's about freedom. And, um, and that, was, that was fun. I did a lot of skydiving, I did a lot of different things. Uh, but then, for some reason, when I was in, living in Finland, I ended up meeting another type of jumpers. 
um, which are more base jumper. So base standing for building antenna span and earth. So it's anything that's connected to the ground and high enough to jump with a parachute. Um, so I, I ended up starting doing that, which was, um, that was probably a, a, a fairly big leap of faith in terms of, of learning how to handle yourself, your body in dead air, meaning when you have zero speed, um, learning how to, you know, to process the fact that, that you might die or you might get injured. But I think the worst part was not, not about myself, because I, I was single, I had no family besides my parents and sister and brother, and they'd be fine if I would be gone. They'd miss me, but, you know, it's no, there's some harm done, but, but not that much of it, compared to having kids and, and a wife and, and so on. Everything is relative, right? So when, when I started that, the, uh, the key part was not that I would die, but my friends would die. Because when you get into that kind of community, that's when you start seeing that, well, you know, it's not just about you, you're a family. There are about 2,500 base jumpers in the world. It's a small team. It's a small group of people. Everybody starts getting to know each other. And, and everybody is taking the same risks, and some people are taking more risks. But still, I gave it a shot. I went into that. I had a blast. I, had, I jumped all over the world. Um, I jumped a building in Los Angeles, completely illegal. Um, but that was a lot of fun. Um, jumped antennas, jumped from my parents' place. Um, there is a, a really known spot. Um, jumped with a wingsuit, jumped in Norway doing acrobatics, and I met amazing people. Although the first jump was challenging because I had to go over all these fears and, and over all these things in my head, it was worth it. It was fun. And, and I, again, I've lost friends, I've lost people, and I've lost somebody not so long ago. I've lost the guy with whom I was on the first jump. I lost other friends. And every time there's an accident, my, you know, I pick up my phone and I first call two or three of my really close friends in the sport. Are you okay? And if they don't pick up, I call their girlfriends or their boyfriends. <laughs> and if they don't pick up, then I find a way to get in touch with them. Um, but so there is still that stress. But one of the things that happened to me is that I didn't get hurt base jumping. But I... I got hurt downhill skiing on my first ride of the winter 2009 in December. So a couple of days after Christmas, we go skiing. I'm, I'm fine, everything is going fine first run. But then I start you know, pushing a bit on the left because there are too many people on the path and, and it's just on the slope and it's just really difficult. And my ski gets into a hole that I didn't see because there was fresh snow and bounces from that hole. So when bouncing, the binding just unlocks. And I lost my left ski on a right curve. So anybody who has ever skied downhill ski knows that you need the external ski more than the internal one on a curve. So what happened is that I went straight into the wall. And it was a rock wall. Um, I, had, I have nine stitches on my forehead. Um, they had to scratch my skull to get the rocks out of it. Um, I dislocated my wrist. Um, they had to put that back uh, with just a couple of shots of morphine on the, uh, at the emergency point before they transported me to the hospital. I spent three days you know, in, in there just making sure that I was stable. I mean, that my body was stable, because was, I've always been a bit crazy. But that, that, you know, I, was, I wasn't in a situation that, that would hurt me more. And, um, but that was not the worst thing. The... Uh, the worst thing was that at the time I was working at the Symbian Foundation and um, I couldn't fly. I was, not st I was stable, but taking a plane and, and, and being on my own in London uh, without any friends or anybody to help me when I had a right wrist that was fucked up, my leg left was a bit still hurting, uh, my head was definitely there most of the time. Um, so flying back there and, and working from there was not really possible. And at the time, uh, my boss was like, no, you had a head trauma, there's no way you're going to work. We're not letting you work, because what if something happens, and you're working when that happens? We're going to be responsible. Like, but I'm fine, I'm okay. I I'm just tired of being on the couch or being on the computer and not doing anything. Please, let me do my job. Sorry, can't do that. So then I came back after a month, and that's when things were getting better, my wrist was okay, and, and I could get back to work. 
But at the same time, the Symbian Foundation had fucked up their budget, and they had to downsize. So they had to let go some people. And uh, well, I'm, I'm going to spare the, uh, uh, the drama, uh, but one morning I ended up in the, the HR office, and uh, my boss was on the screen because she was in San Francisco, and uh, Julian, you're fired. Okay, thanks. So, how about the package? How about the next things? You know, how is it going to work? How about my computer? And all that kind of stuff. What I realized there was that although I was really passionate about my job, although I was really, really engaged with the company, I shouldn't have. Not that way. Because ultimately, they didn't care. There was no emotions. It was like, you know, you're a number on a spreadsheet, and we need to have higher numbers, so we're dropping one of them, and two of them, and three of them. So basically, we're a bunch of, like, a couple of guys who were let go at that time, and, um, and it took me 20 seconds to bounce. And I was like, all right, what am I going to do with the next four months that I have paid without doing anything? And that's when I set up the Catalyst. So I set up my own consultancy company, um, and, and that's when I had the opportunity to do amazing stuff, uh, but it wasn't easy, you know. How do you set up a company when you don't know anything about the UK? Well, you ask, and you figure it out. So again, you have, you have to put yourself out. You have to give it a shot. You have to you know, try something. Is it going to work? Am I going to be able to, do, you know, to help people in mobile strategy? Well, yes, I've done that for companies. Maybe I could do that for like, outside of a company to other people. So I did that for about a year, and I had a lot of fun. I traveled. I went to conferences. I was invited to speak, even at the... I think at the time, it's still the Migo conference in, in Dublin and things like that. So it was, it was really interesting. But at the same time, it was not what I wanted to do. I wanted to build products. I wanted to do something. So when at that point, I had the opportunity to, uh, um, to meet people from Google and from Rovio, and I did some stuff from Rovio, and, and they both offered me a job, and then decided that Finland was not that bad after all, and I could probably have some fun here and, and help discover Helsinki after having spent six years in Tampere. Um, so, yeah, that was probably the bad part of Finland. <laughs> um, no, it was fun. I, I really love Tampere. And, um, and then ultimately decided that, okay, well, I'll give it a shot. And Rovio was a, a growing company, and it was still a small, um, small structure. So I was employee 56. Uh, I think now they're at 500-something. Um, but basically, again, moving from a place that I knew, London, where I had tons of friends and I had tons of people that I've been working with and, and some were offering me jobs and Google was offering me a job with a fairly interesting salary. And when I told them that, sorry, I'm not going to come to you, they said, how much do you want? I said, well, it's not about the money. What is it about? Well, I'm going to Rovio. Oh, okay. Then there's not much thing we can do, right? It's like, nope. Sorry. So, so basically, it was, I, I still had, I had to let go everything that I had built for two years to rebuild everything in Helsinki. So now I've been here for two years, and, and I've already left Rovio, um, but that's for another reason. Uh, but getting back to sports, it's um, not only I had my ski accident and it fucked up my professional life one way or another, I think it didn't really fuck it up, it just gave me an opportunity that I, I wouldn't have taken myself otherwise. Um, but, but thinking about that, it's my right wrist, right? And even now, I don't feel it completely. Now, to open your parachute, you need your right hand. You just open, deploy a small parachute, that deploys the big parachute. So, what do you do when you don't trust your right hand? I mean, I'm not talking business, I'm talking real, you know, right hand. Like, what do you do when you don't trust it? You can't do that anymore. And that, that was the problem I was in, right? Would my hand lock when I would try to open my parachute? Would I be able to grab the handle? Would I feel it the same way? I didn't know. So what I did is I went in an airplane with a parachute on my back and gave it a shot. But it was safe, because if my right hand would have worked, I would still be able to cut away and open with the left one. So that was fairly okay. But then, then I realized, okay, 
skydiving is fine, but I really want to get back to base jumping. I want to get back to something that I've, I really missed. And, and to be honest, this is probably, what you're going to see is, is probably my biggest leap of faith in, on a personal level, in, in believing in myself and trusting myself. Because when you're at the edge, it's only about you and the elements. It's not about your colleagues, it's not about your friends, it's not about your family, it's how did you pack your parachutes, how do you feel today, have you checked that every single element is right, is it windy, is it not windy, what is the, how is it landing and all that kind of stuff, and are you ready to make that happen? So I went back training, I went back to it, and I decided that I'm not going to let myself stop by a small accident, because a ski accident to me is a small accident. I could be in a wheelchair, I'm not. So I should, I should make the most out of what I have. have so I, I did get back to the edge. I did one. get back to the cliff. This is in Switzerland. Um, I, I went there this spring, um, I think it was in May. Um, yeah, around May. And uh, decided that I would, you know, I would get back to it. So I'm, I got myself ready, I got my parachute packed up, I'm 300 something meters, almost 400 meters above the ground, and, and what do I do? I freak out. <laughs> I try to find any possible way to distract myself from what I really want to do, and, and I'm thinking about, did I pack my parachute right? I visualize the way packing my parachute. Did I forget something? No, probably not, maybe, I don't know. Well, not sure. Should I go? Shouldn't I go? Did I really want to do that? Why do people do that? <laughs> What's the point? What's the meaning of life? 42. Oh, maybe. All right. Well, let's give it a shot. Three, two, one. See ya. So obviously everything went fine. I'm still here. <laughs> but basically the point is that Although I had done that before, it took me 60 seconds at the edge. I had done 70 something base jumps before. I'd done base jumps where I didn't even take one second. I would just run off there. I've taken base jumps where I, yeah, well, I had, I had a really close calls. But this one that was supposed to be a, a safe one took me 60 seconds to get done. But I still did it. And now I feel a lot better. And, and I still can't trust my right hand. But then again, I'm on, I don't want to live you know, thinking about what if. What if I didn't do that? What if, I, you know, what if I had done it? What would have happened? So getting back to business, the, uh, you know, this is a picture that's probably going to make you laugh. You might have seen that one before. Um, it was a friend of mine who was like, oh, you're leaving Rovio. Can I do something fun? It's like, what do you want to do? <laughs> well, I got that idea of, of a scarlet going through birds. Like, well, sure, just go ahead. Uh, this became the header page of uh, Forbes, the day I left Robio, which was uh, kind of exciting for my friend. He was like, what? <laughs> you got that there? Thank you very much. Well, I didn't do anything. I just gave the link to the press. So how did we get there? Um, well, it, it's again another, another kind of leap of faith. It's, it's just that... Yona and I, who is, uh, you can raise your hand, Yona. Uh, so Yona and I met uh, back in, in August last year. Um, we were going to uh, a poltarit, a bachelor party of a common friend. Um, I had no idea how to get there. The friend organizing said, well, there's this guy called Yona, and he's leaving from Espo, so he can maybe pick you up, and then maybe you can go to Turku. Um, so we, uh, we end up in the same, like he end up, ends up giving me a ride, and we talked about everything, life, women, cars, tech, anything. I mean, you know, Turku is a long way from here. So we had, we had a lot of fun. And then we spent an amazing weekend with our friend, um, dressing him up as a pom-pom girl, um, doing some, um, some uh, laser game, um, doing some... Uh, well, we, we did a, a jump. Uh, we jumped from a plane to his cottage. Um, so that was, that was pretty interesting. It was quite intense because we couldn't see much and we weren't sure where the cottage was. Um, but it was fun. 
And then, of course, a couple of drinks and, and more drinks and maybe a bit more drinks and, and not too much sleep. But that's, that's how we got to know each other about a year ago. And a couple of months later, we had kept in touch on Facebook and, uh, and we bumped into each other in a cafe um, where, well, uh, it was a cafe where he was with his wife after going to a, a concert. We were on a, on a pop crawl. So that was, that was just one of the pit stops. Jonah had said, well, why don't you just drop by here? And he's like, well, yeah, yeah, we could just say hi. I'm not going to drink here, but we're going to say hi. So, and Jonah was really excited. He was like, I've got, I've got this crazy idea that I've been working on for a while, and, and I really would like to share that with you. And it's about the electric and electric cars. Huh. That sounds interesting. Yeah, well, hey, you know what? Let's just slow down. Let's have dinner on Monday. Let's talk about that. So we had dinner at Virgin Oil, and we talked about life and things and others. And then at the end of the dinner, he popped up his laptop, and he said, all right, this is the, the beef. I just had one. Now, this is the real thing. This is, you know, this is the main thing. And, um, and he pitched me Scarlett. And he said that, well, we're building an electric sports car. Hmm, that's interesting. Tell me more. And basically, as, as much as he was going, I realized that there were a lot of pieces in my brains that started to kind of get closer with each other. And, and I was like, well, hold on, these things fit together. Now, I've, I've been doing stuff in mechanics, I've been to, doing stuff in automation, in electronics, in computer sciences, networks, in mobile, in apps and services, in games. And, and I could see a lot of these things kind of coming together around the concept of an electric car. And yes, I've been driving Formula Renault and a couple of these cars as, a, as a gifts for my 20th birthday and my 30th birthday. So I've been a bit lucky with that kind of things. But basically, I could see these things fit. But I had bad experiences before in, in starting new businesses. I had been burned too many times. So I was like, well, you know, yeah, that sounds interesting. Well, how do you want me to help? Well, I'd like you to help me drive the product development and, and we can see where we can go. And um, oh yeah, sure. So started spending one night a week. Let's just catch up. Tell me more about the concept. Let's brainstorm. Um, two nights a week, three nights a week, every single evenings, weekends. And then I started digging myself in, in the whole EV industry, in, in the whole scene. And, and of course, I was having fun at Rovio, and, and it, was, it was quite interesting to you know, keep on doing things there. But ultimately, you know, when, when I also saw the product, which unfortunately we're not going to show here today, but, but when I saw the product, I was like, well, you know, there is really something there. There is really something that we can do that is going to change the world. And, and it's not necessarily going to be about the car itself. Like, the car is really important. It's, it's a means of transportation. It's, a, it's, it's an element of joy and, and passion for some people. Um, but, but there could be an opportunity to make the world a better place thanks to these products. Help people be better drivers, help to reduce the cost and the, like the impact on the environment, but also help people having more fun. Why should it be boring to drive? Why should it be a, like a Kleenex? I use my car, you know, after a while I don't like it anymore, I'll just get another one. Why, why does it have to be a utility? I mean, how many people have a car here? How many people, no, keep your hands up, All right? How many have families? Yeah, how many cars do you have? Precisely. So basically, the whole thing was that, can we have an impact with a sports car on, let's say, 90% of the drivers? Is it possible? What can we do? Well, if we make one, you know, one car, and that car is safe, and that car helps, and that car reduced the impact on the environment, it's already one more than the existing ones. Right? But if we make more of those, then it might have better impact. So we, we launched, after this amount of time, when, you know, when we started working on a prototype of a website, and, and I was still working on Rovio, so I was, I was really spending, like burning the candles by both ends. Um, but we, during my holidays, um, that's when we really spent a lot more time working on the platform and, and working on how do we kind of make things happen and move forward. And, and when we realized that, okay, we now have most of the pieces, we have the people interested in, in the partner network, uh, we've, we've done the math, we know that this is possible, 
Then at that time, I, I took a month of holidays from Rovio. I spent a bit more time on that. Then I spent time also on my own thinking. And I realized, like, well, I've been in that situation before. When I was at university, I, I built with a bunch of my friends a laser projector. So we built that thing that, that could display pictures and, and forms and, and shapes and, and all these kind of things like in nightclubs, um, but in a one-tenth of the size and one-twentieth of the cost. We capitalized on a technology that was just coming out, which was solid-state laser, to replace the huge tubes that were used that needed cooling and everything. So in a really tiny package, we had a prototype that most of the guys in the industry were like, how did you do that? And it was running Linux, it was independent, it had Wi-Fi, you could just put it remotely and control it. People were blown away. But I was 22, I had no idea about business, I had no idea how to get money, I had no idea how to make a product and a company out of that. So I passed. I didn't have the balls. So with, with Scarlett, I realized that, okay, I'm in the same situation. I have a job, I have something that I can keep on doing, and then on the same si at the same time, I have a great opportunity of, of doing something that I'm passionate about and, and that gives me, that drives me. Well, I'll drive it later, but now it drives me to move forward. So I decided to jump. You know, what's the worst that can happen? I'm not going to die. At least none of that. Maybe a base jumping, but that's a different story, right? What, what's the worst that can happen? that I'm going to have fun for six months and, and maybe it's going to work? Or that I'm going to have fun for six months and maybe it's not going to work? Oh, still, I would have fun you know, for six months. And I would have learned a lot. I would have developed myself in the field that I didn't really know much about and, and met new people and done great things. So this is pretty much what happened. And, but now, you know, the, the kind of dream behind Scarlet is, is more than just being a car. It's more than just building a product. It's really to give that opportunity for people to, you know, to experience the fun of driving, the joy of driving, to really get this, this kind of emotion back, the passion of cars and so on. And doing that also in creating a, a kind of healthy ecosystem. And something which is more, of course, sustainable for the environment and so on. But, but essentially, what's happening is that the, the legacy car business is broken. If you look at it, everything is about cost reduction, everything is about making you change your product, everything is about marketing. You know, a car manufacturer sells you a car, there's a new model that comes out almost right after he sold you the car. Okay, Finland is a different situation because you have really old cars. So you might already have two or three generations after the one you just bought. But, but ultimately, you get into that situation where the company that sold you a car has to spend money to make you buy another one. Does that make any sense? I mean, it's called customer reacquisition. It's not customer acquisition where you have to spend a certain amount of money to get a customer. No, it's customer reacquisition. For every single product you make, you have to reacquire the customer. I mean, this is insane. This is nonsense. So that's one of the things. But not only that, from the supply chain to the customer, everything is broken. My family has 56 years of business in manufacturing parts. At least half of them is for the automotive industry. They're being squeezed every single month for cheaper prices, for lower margins, for increase of quality, and still more flexibility in quantities. The second tier, first tier suppliers for the automotive industry are shrinking the margins. No matter if the prices of the metal increases, they still want a cheaper part. So what happens is that a lot of companies are going out of business because they just can't do that. So instead of consolidating by having companies, you know, building on top of each other and growing, it's just, okay, I'll buy you out because you're so cheap because you're not worth anything anymore. Because our supplier made sure that you would be dead. So the whole, the whole kind of supply chain is broken. The whole consumer experience is broken because nowadays, well, you go to a dealership, how much impact do you have on the car? 
how much can you really you know, give feedback? You're an existing customer. You drive, let's say, a BMW in Finland. That's quite common. You want to give feedback. You say, well, this car is great, but these things are not working that well, and it would be so much better if you would fix them. The dealer looks at you, he's like, so do you want the new model? Because they might have fixed it on it. You can try. No, I, this, that's not what I mean. Is that can, can, I have any, can I give my feedback to somebody? Yeah, sure, I can put it through the chain. There are about 20 intermediaries between me and the guy who developed that thing. Sure, go ahead. So everything is kind of going down. The, the quality of service, the quality of the products, you know, even the pricing becomes really difficult, the differentiations of the product. But, but not really for everybody. I mean, if you look at the results, you look at BMW, for example, as, as a company, they're making a lot of money. And they're a public company, so you can, you can look at their numbers. They're making really, really good profits. But now go to a BMW dealership. Ask them how much money they're making. Well, they'll tell you, well, well we're barely breaking even. We're having a really hard time. Hold on, you're a BMW dealership, right? BMW is making money. You should be making money. No, we're not. And, and we probably are going to have a really, really hard time to survive the next six months because of whatever recession, because of whatever thing happening. So, as I said, things are broken and there is an opportunity to do something, something better. But still, car manufacturers are milking the customers. They're still trying to extract as much money as, you, as possible. 1,500 euros for a GPS? Really? It costs you 150 to manufacture? And you charge 1,500 for it? No, you just don't want to sell it. Or you want to sell it to people that have the money to pay for it. So this is, this is the whole kind of thing. And as I said, consumers don't have much impact. They take pretty much whatever comes out of the manufacturing line. And when it comes out of the manufacturing line, it's already obsolete because there's a new car waiting to get in the manufacturing line which has new options, new things, and so forth. So how, you know, how, long, how long can that last? And if we look at GM, if we look at all these big companies, they've been losing money all along. How come are they losing money? They're still manufacturing cars. They're still selling cars. So how, how come they can be losing money if, if they keep on selling products? It means that there is definitely something broken there. Now, the demand has been going up and down based on the crisis and so forth, but it's still pretty strong. People still need cars. So what can be done different? Can, you know, can the consumers be like, trusted? Are those consumers stupid or are they smart? And in this audience, how many people give feedback about one of their brands? Let it be on Twitter, let it be on Facebook. How many voice their opinion? If you've ever voiced your opinion about a brand, raise your hand. How many have gotten feedback from voicing your opinion? Was it for local businesses or large businesses? Depends, right? But there is a trend. There's a trend in which consumers want to be part of it. They want to learn. They want to figure out what's going on. They want to have the right to evaluate the quality of a product. They want to have the right to say that, yes, this company is making good product because I understand the product, or this company could do better and I'm not interested in, work in buying from them. So that's, what, that's pretty much what we're focusing on. We open the community in order to give an opportunity for people to learn and in order to give an opportunity for people to participate. Because we are learning, right? And it's been really exciting. So why not sharing that knowledge? Why not giving a chance for people to discover what the automotive industry is? Discover that in the end, an electric car is a lot simpler to manufacture, to handle, to maintain than a gasoline car. To figure out that by learning with other people and not just by marketing bullshit. Right? I mean, there's, there are tons of reports that are popping up right now of car manufacturers not willing to promote electric vehicles because it undermines the sales of gasoline vehicles. They've invested for 100 years in developing gasoline products. Why would they just stop that? Why would they just stop milking the cow? So we're definitely sharing, and we want to base our community on education and openness. 
we're the, tr the most transparent car manufacturer, although we're still at early stage, you, know, you can join the community on scarletmotors.com. You'll be accepted. If you have a, an Alto or a Finnish email address, then you'll just go through straight away. Um, if you have a Gmail or something like that, just send me a message on Facebook or somewhere else. Uh, we've got tons of people registering that, that we don't necessarily know, and, and we like to first engage in that beta phase with the people that we can talk with and meet. Um, but basically, within the next month, we'll be opening that up to everybody, and then, and then it's about contributing, it's about sharing, it's about developing these things together. So we definitely want to give an opportunity for you guys to shape part of the product, not necessarily you know, the uh, design, because this is something that, that we've worked on for about a year or so, it is pretty much there. Uh, but when it comes to technology, where it comes to consumer experience, when it comes to services associated to the product, what are the things that you want to interact with? And, and right now, you have as much impact as we do because you know, we're consumers. We're looking at the product as consumers. We're not going and doing market studies that as soon as you've received them are not valid anymore. We, we really want to have this engagement with the people and understand what they want. And then at the same time, it's not just a forum for people, it's, it's a forum for professionals. So our partners are part of that forum. So we have companies there that have now direct access to our consumers. And you might think that, oh, this is scary. But in the end, the person that's gonna be coding the infotainment display, or that's gonna be designing the seat, or that's gonna be doing like the charger, if these people can interact directly with you, then you have an opportunity to make things better. You close the loop. You have a tighter feedback loop in, in which the product can look better, the product can be better, the product can make more sense for the consumers. Um, we, you know, we've been looking at the future and what is the future that we want to build because we're now in still the prototyping phase the product is not going to be ready for a while um, in terms of commercial uh, value. And, and how do we see the next two, three, four, five, six, fifteen 15 years? Because when you start a car company, it's not a website. You just don't put it up and, and you know, wait until your subscription to Amazon goes down because you didn't pay and, and then the site is gone. No, you have, you have to support the product for 15 years, even not more. And that's our interest. Our interest is really to have a product that's sustainable, a product that's more of a classic, that, that you'll be able to make evolve using software and, and maybe some electronics changes and, and so forth, rather than having to buy a new product. So how, how do we see the future in, in 15 years? Well, the future that we see is that, you know, it's a future where cars are not Kleenex anymore. It's not, it's not that you, know, you wanna get rid of it. It's, it's more like part of the family. It's something that the kids are going to want to drive on. They want to learn to drive on your car, on dad's car or mom's car, because women that have seen our car are pretty excited about it. It's quite sexy for both genders. Um, but basically, it's, it's a car that, that becomes part of the family, a car that you're going to be able to have an impact on. Maybe you'll be able to take it to the track in which you can test it and, and you can push it, you can add new features to it and so forth. But, but ultimately, it's going to be something that's going to evolve. It's also something, an object that's going to be part of our digital life in a seamless manner. That it will integrate. It's not going to be tweeting that, hey, Julian is at the, uh, at the grocery store. But it might monitor the tweets and know that there is an accident on a certain road and then indicate you that you might want to take another road. Or it might look at Facebook and Foursquare and all these things and say that, hey, there are a couple of other Scarlet drivers around. If you want, you could organize a meetup. You know, just talk, meet people that have the same value, that are part of the Scarlet community. Or maybe it will do other things. But ultimately, it's just going to be there without you to think about it, without you to really, uh, what was the button that I had to press? There are 50,000 of them. I don't remember. Next time I learn how to fly a plane, it's probably going to be easier. No, it's going to be seamless. And it's also a future where kids get excited by sports cars. No matter what they become, you know, they will change. A Ford Mustang from back in the days 
and a Ford Mustang today is a different Ford Mustang. A Porsche from 1940, 1950-something uh, is a different Porsche than one that came out now. But they're still fun. They're still aspirational. They're still something that when a kid sees that, he's like, yeah, it's got four wheels, it looks good, and I would love to drive one of those. But gasoline is not necessarily going to be there anymore in 20 years. So why not having more fun with electric, with the full acceleration that you can get, sticking your butt in the seat and giving you that roll feeling in your arms. So, you know, yes, in a way it's a, it's a, it's a big dream, it's a big idea, as, as we say here on this stage. Um, but it's more than just an idea. It's a project. And it's a project that's moving forward, one step at a time. We've been doing a great work with our partners. We've announced partnership with Metropolia, for example, that has developed a lot of technologies and, and also that has a lot of talented students and talented um, core employees. Um, so we're doing things with them. Then there are a couple of other places. We definitely want to get more involved with universities because I use myself, to, I used to be part of uh, Tampereen Teknillinen Yliopisto, where I was a researcher in micro nano sensor networks. So we really, really see the opportunity of young talents that want to push the boundaries and give them that option, give them that opportunity. Um, but at the same time, we're still moving forward. And with the community, we are making you know, faster step every day. But you know, Rome wasn't built in one day, and Scarlet won't be either. It'll take time. But that's as exciting as the result. Because the journey has begun, and it's up to you guys to be part of it. Discover, interact, engage, watch from behind, watch from the side, but ultimately one day telling your kids that, you know what? I was part of making a car, and it was fun, and I learned a lot. And maybe I got a job, or maybe I just got my name on a website, or maybe I got my name on one of the parts of the car, or maybe I just got a chance to drive it. But when was the last time that a car company was born? It was 2003, in the known ones. It's called Tesla, and it's doing pretty good by focusing on only electric cars. And this is our future. Thank you. Um, hi, um, you, you work in two very, well, now you work in Scarlet and before you were in Rovio. Um, what do you feel are the main challenges of a company in this stage? And how do you compare with a company like that ha has been growing like crazy, like Rovio? Um, well, there are different things. So the, the challenges between a company at our stage, which is uh, two full-time employee, uh, 10 part-time employee, and then uh, about 40 more with our partners and about, let's say, 200 potential employees in the community that are active and then another 800 that we could activate, uh, which is still quite really interesting in terms of development. I think that the challenge for us is, um, is, is of course, um, believing in what we do. It's, it's, it's the most important thing. It's not only the passion, but making you know, that, that leap of faith. I'm still in between two things. I still, I mean, I've jumped out of Rovio and I, I'm flying with Scarlett, but, you know, but it's not going to be done until, until we have customers, we have sold cars, and, and we've run the company for many years, which I think is, is the, big of a, the, the small challenge in there, or the big challenge. It is, it is making sure that you know, you're passionate enough and you have the drive to make that happen then in my position as the CEO of the company, I think that the biggest challenge is that, um, well, above me I have the board, so I have a couple of guys that, you know, that are there, but they're more there as uh, kind of advisors and making sure that we're doing things properly. They're not there to pat me in the back. So it, it is also a bit more challenging in that respect. But as a company, it's really keeping the passion, keeping the excitement, and keeping things going. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, nice job so far. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, my mom uh, is quite proud. <laughs> I bet. Actually, my question was about the design. You said that you're not gonna just yet reveal any any pictures of that of the design. But uh, do you have like a designer in your team or or do you? Yeah, out, we have outside. So the, the way we've worked is that we've um, we've looked at Finland and and looked at what can we do with Finland as a whole. And we identified a lot of the key technologies already here in this country. So although I'm French and half Swiss and, and we could have moved the headquarters to a place where there is more money and there is more industry and all that kind of stuff, we realized that all the technologies, sorry, and all the, um, all the design and all these opportunities were here. They were just untapped. And, and if they would have been tapped, nobody would know about it in Finland. So we're working with a designer that has 15 years of experience in designing cars, that has worked with Zagato, Honda, um, Jaguar. He's done concept cars and so forth. And, and he, he has not only the eye, but the know-how in design and in mechanics that makes it easier to build a product and faster. So, so basically, we do have talented people on board let it be as partners or as, as kind of team members, um, but we were moving forward with these things. And now we're, we're talking with somebody else who, who is from Finland and living abroad, and, and she said that, hey, you know, I would really love to help you guys, because I really believe that what you're doing is different and makes sense. What can I do? And, and Jona had a conversation today with her, and she's going to start looking at our interior design, because we already have, you know, he's an amazing designer, um, he already has put things together, but nothing that's manufacturable. So, but that's, that's kind of how we roll, is that people are just asking us, how can we help? Cool, thanks. Hi. Hello. Do you know uh, how you differ, or how you're going to differ from Tesla, for instance? Well, I'm going to ask a question. Why do we need to differ from Tesla? I don't know. <laughs> we don't. The point is that Tesla cannot manufacture enough cars. And that's, that's a good problem to have, is that they're ramping up their production and they can't manufacture enough. It shows that there is a demand for the product and every single Tesla Roadster, the 2,500 of them, have had either one or two already uh, acquired. So they've, they've been recycling these cars. So basically what's happening is there are, there are two different ecosystems. You have the traditional gasoline ecosystem, and you have the new ecosystem of electric cars. And, and somewhere, they're connected. They're connected because most of the car manufacturers need to offset carbon. The carbon that their cars produce, their gasoline car produce, they need to offset it. So they use electric cars or hybrid cars to offset the carbon. That's, that's one of the key reasons why these manufacturers are pushing towards that energy is to offset carbon and pay less taxes. Now, Tesla is a purely electric company. There is no background in, in gasoline or anything like that. We don't have any background either in that. We're pushing forward in that electric ecosystem. But there's huge room. So why do we need to differentiate from them at, at this stage? I mean, we, we have differentiators, but still, I'm asking the question, why do we need to differentiate? They don't have a sports car anymore on the market. You can't buy a roaster anymore. Um, how do you think about the system now um, for the gasoline car? Because of they go to the gas station, but for your cars, you need to set up a whole new system for electronic uh, recharge. So are you going to like start these parts now, or are you more willing to do that later? So I'm, I'm going to take an analogy. Um, when was the last time you went to a shop to buy a CD? Never. The music industry and the movie industry has moved from places where you buy physical products to peer-to-peer -peer technologies, where everybody gets stuff, well, not necessarily for free, but, but there is a free flow of information. 
why would we want to go to the same model as the major, as the gasoline, the gas stations where you have people controlling the price of the gas when you could plug your car anywhere? And the cost of recharging your car is cheaper than buying a beer to your friend. It's a couple of euros, two or three euros if you, ha if you get a full charge. You know, I, c I could see a Tesla, uh, sorry, a, a Scarlet Motors piggy bank at people's place and like, well, I just charge my car, here you go, two, three euros. And then go for a track day with that money or go to a restaurant or something. But I don't, I don't believe, for example, there's a company called Better Place that does replacement of the batteries. So you drive your car somewhere and they replace your battery. Great. Now, how much are you going to pay for that? It costs more money to set up that place, that battery changing station. It costs more money to do the action of changing the battery than it costs in electricity. And on top of that, you have to have a specific car. Now, in Europe, you can plug 220, you can charge for eight, in eight hours, seven hours. Now, you can plug on the, uh, on the electric um, heater boxes in Finland, although they don't recommend it and they even forbid it, it, it could be possible. So th these kind of things, rather than, than go to a model where you have to have a charging station. So now in Finland, there's a company called, um, was it the, uh, the, the major, um, the yellow things? The, no, 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 they, uh, they have these uh, shopping centers on the highways and, and the gas stations. ABC, sorry. Um, so they, they're going to set up char fast charging stations on the way, on the highways. Um, so in that respect, if you're traveling on a longer time, then you might want to have fast charging. And fast charging, you can pay for it, right? Because it's, it's faster and, and it's, it's kind of, you go for dinner or lunch and, and you charge your car in between. So there is a, there's a whole opportunity for ABC to, to get more customers. But, but ultimately, why, you know, why would you need to pay more for your energy than it really costs to produce? Yeah, thank you for your question, uh, answers. Um, what about your approach and market? Um, have you ever think about how to approach into young generation in Chinese, uh, China and the other Asia market, which yep. usually they more focus on like luxury stuff? Yeah, so we've thought about it. And um, what we believe in is in order to be successful in Asia, you have to be successful in Europe. You have to set up your brand in Europe to be a brand that's exciting, that's European. And then if you migrate to China, then there is an opportunity to hit you know, the sweet spot. The same was, uh, I mean, Yola, for example, is looking at that. Um, they, they capitalize on Migo, which is connected to Nokia, Intel, and a couple of other companies, which, is, which has shown with the N9 that it's a really great opportunity. And they're now looking at China for capitalizing on that. But manufacturing straight in China without having any brand would be a shame because we are based in Helsinki in Finland and we can build the brand in Europe. For one more question. I'm just elaborating on the previous question about the differentiation because, well, yeah. companies are competing organizational forms. Mm -hmm. And it's a sort of survival ecosystem kind of game. So the whole point is that if there's no point in doing a business unless you plan to be the best at something. So now if you think that you're not going to have any added value in your model, which you're designing now to Tesla's models, then it doesn't really make any sense to design a new model at all. And if it's really a question just about capacity that there is for production, if it's about uh, facilities or s production worker skills or whatever the, the bottleneck is, wouldn't it make much more sense just to become, just to invest in facilities and become a subcontractor for Tesla? Like yeah. if, if, you, if your series is going to differentiate in any ways, then there isn't yeah, really yeah, a point course. in designing a new yeah, product. I, I, just I completely them. agree with you. The thing is, I wanted to refocus the question in the sense showing that there was not necessarily, there is of course a differentiation, but right now there is a, an opportunity that is bigger than the differentiation of the product. The other thing is, our differentiation on the product is pretty much to make a product that's going to evolve in time. That's going to be modular 
and that you'll be able to upgrade without having to change it. Why would you change a car that you really enjoy driving when you're not sure that the next model is going to be as good as this one? You know, it has your own feeling, it, it has all these things. So our interest is really to make the product evolve on, you know, half a year basis, software upgrades, new services, electronics upgrades, new opportunities, increased range, all these kind of things, rather than trying to sell you a new car. So that's our differentiator in key. And then, of course, there are more things that are going to come, but it's hard to speak about them when you don't sit in the car and you can't experience it yourself. You know, when the iPhone came, people were like, well, yes, that's the Apple smartphone. Well, no, it was way more than that. But it needed people to experience it and use it for them to realize how powerful it was. So you're clearly going for a more sort of customer-centric approach, Completely. even more so than Tesla. Completely. Right, they're pretty much there yep. too. But are you looking for more sort of customization potential there too? Well, that's one of the things. But the other thing is we're looking more at a an kind of a balance between traditional manufacturing and, and car brands and consumer electronic brands. Which is right now, Tesla is still a new old car manufacturer. They're not necessarily pushing too far in terms of, of consumer electronic approach. Although they put an iPad or an equivalent in, in the dashboard, it, it's still pretty, let's say, conservative. And I'm happy to elaborate more on these things you know, at a later time. It's, again, it's hard to be able to talk about these things when we can't share the product. But if you have ideas, scarletmotors.com. Thanks. Cool, but just, just yeah. Let's give give big hand to Julian before. Thanks to you. And and now, as as usual, we have some big time beer in the lobby, so feel free to grab. grab so that's some. what people were here for. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs>